Hi, this is Sci-Fi Talk. I'm Tony Tolado, where I share my love and obsession with science fiction, fantasy, horror, and comics with interviews with other like-minded fans like you, perhaps. I talk to people that write, make, and also act in those particular projects. Lately, I've noticed that Trek Tuesday has become popular with Star Trek fans of all ages. So for the next few weeks, I'll be featuring Star Trek interviews on Tuesdays. This week, we start off with an actor that we did lose. It's always tough when you lose an actor in Star Trek. It's like part of the family. And that's going to be my interview with Aaron Eisenberg that was taped during Star Trek Deep Space Nine's run. Aaron, I wanted to ask you what the uh, casting process was like uh, for you on Deep Space Nine. Well, actually, I first started, you know, when they were obviously going for the show, and I, I went to audition, and I had no idea. Uh, I went to the audition. I'm like, oh, some character Nog. And I'm like, okay, well, well what is it? And they're all, it's a Ferengi. And I'm like, oh, okay, great. Well, what's a Ferengi? And uh, Ron Surma, he was the casting director, and he proceeded to tell me and gave me a script. And we kind of went over it, and he said, look, here's a couple tapes. And he gave me a couple tapes, I think. One was the last outpost, and I was looking, watching those a little bit. I'm like, oh, I see, okay. So I went in for the audition, and it was really kind of um, difficult. I'm, I walk in, and there's like seven there's like seven people, you know, out in front of, behind the desk. I'm like, oh my god, in one chair. So I walk in and I have to act like this kind of crazy little character, you know, which I really don't have any visual idea except other than what I saw. But when you're out of makeup, it's a lot harder to play the character than when you're in makeup. So I'm out there playing the character, going. And the scene I actually auditioned was um, when I first meet Jake, and that was the I seen audition, and I, I I nailed it the first time, and I left, and they called me back and. I didn't do as good the second time, but they cast me because I did so good the first time. And, I, and being older, over 18, and they could use me a lot longer and all that stuff. And, and I looked like a kid. You know, it just worked out. I was very fortunate. And, you know, Nog has really gone through a lot in, 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 his, uh, in the years on, on uh, Deep Space Nine. What recollections do you have, like, when you did the original pilot? Because uh, you're, you're one of the few actors that have been there from the beginning a few right. years ago. My <laughs> recollections was I don't know if I'll ever work again on this show. I was really uh, paranoid, as you might say, that, oh, I'm not doing a good enough job, and I'm not gonna, they're not going to call me back. Because they told you it was a reoccurring character, but that doesn't mean they're going to make it a reoccurring character. They could say, you know, he's just not doing a good job. Let's cut the character. But instead, it went the other direction, you know, and they just kept writing more. And, you know, I didn't work actually for like five months after the first two episodes because I worked in the first one and then The Man Alone. They actually cut my my scene up that was in my two scenes that was in the original episode into the first one and the second one, which is good for me because then I made more money and I got to work twice and it was a lot of fun. But then they didn't work for five months after, so I really thought, oh, great, I'm never working again on that show. Well, it was fun while it lasted. Then they called me back, and I had an ep two episodes back-to-back. -back. Then I did another one, and then the one at the end of the season. So I was really, I was very fortunate. So that's what was how I was looking at the beginning. And now I'm just keeping, like, reading a book. I'm, like, wondering what's going to happen next, you know? Where's Nog going to go now, now that I'm in Starfleet? It's really exciting. How much of a, of a blank page was Nog? How much of it did you fill in yourself? When it, when you first came to the character, basically I, I feel that the character I, I developed, um, for so to speak. I mean, not in terms of where he's gone and the choices he's made, but the way he acts and the way he responds and the way he talks is all me. No one gave me any except Armin and Max are the only ones that maybe have helped me. Especially at the beginning, Armin did because you know I was like kind of lost and listened to him and I wanted to have a character voice. I didn't want it to be my own voice, so I kind of made it raspy. He has a kind of a, a raspy, especially more at the beginning of the season. Now he's getting older, it's more coming in my own voice. Um, and then the way he talks, there's a, there's a rhythm to it. It's just really, I can't, I can't, I usually can't get into it until I'm, I'm in full makeup, which is unlike Max's character, which I can do. I can imitate his character very easily. That's what I put into it. But the writers wrote, you know, the words and, and, and the outline and where he's going to go and what his choice he's going to make. I just chose to make him very high energy and, fun and even though he was a he was like the huck finn to the huck finn and tom sawyer that's kind of what i tell i've said a lot he's, he's you know jake's the tom sawyer and i'm the huck finn where he's the bad boy but you like him you know he's not like a punk he's just he's just a little troublemaker who's always having fun you know but he's got a big heart you know that's an interesting analogy the huck finn and tom sawyer thing because when you when you see especially in the early episodes how their friendship developed and all that very much like that i think yeah. there's even a part where huck taught Tom to read or something, if I remember from the old oh, book. Really? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah and I, thought, I think Nog has a, a better understanding of humans than any of the other Ferengis because of his relationship with Jake. And I think that's going to give him his 
his advantage in Starfleet, so to speak. And he's got the, he's got the, the, the you know, the energy of a Ferengi to get what he needs to get done. You know, as a Ferengi has their, their skull set on profit and they get that done, even though they do it not necessarily in the best way. But I think Nog will do the same in our, in Starfleet, maybe not in the best way. And he'll learn from that. I think Nog's got a big heart, which I think hopefully we'll see more of someday. Another thing too is, uh, is, uh, Sirak Lofton who plays, uh, Jake. Uh, it seems like you both have a chemistry, uh, as actors and as characters. A lot of people have said that. And I really love when I hear that. And, um, uh, Jake, I mean, Sirak is, is, is a great guy. And, and we have a lot of fun together when we're just waiting to shoot the shot and stuff. And he's, he's a very fine actor too. I mean, when you're watching some of his stuff, especially like in The Visitor, he was just fantastic. And so is, you know, Avery and Tony Todd. I just love that episode. And I don't get a, lo- a chance to watch a lot of the episodes because I actually don't even have TV. But where I live, is we don't have cable and stuff, so I got to get it. But I'm so busy, I don't get a chance to watch it. But I saw that. I was able to see that one, and I just thought they were great. And, and yeah, back to chemistry with, with Ciroc. I don't know how you get that. Or, you know, you don't try for that. You just do the scenes, and if it works, it works, you know. And, and I guess because we like each other, and we get along, and, and we we goof around a little bit, nothing like serious. We're just kind of, he's a good guy. He's a great guy. Well, you, you mentioned it, something I wanted to touch on, the visitor. I liked Captain Nog. I thought it was kind of neat. Uh, yeah. What was it like to uh, sort of be a captain? Uh, uh, it was uh, it was really quite scary because I, I was very afraid that it was just going to look like Nog trying to be a captain, you know, as a kid. And I was really afraid because when you're so stuck in playing a character one way, and all of a sudden you got to make him older. I mean, it's easy for me to play older because I'm older. Okay, but it's one thing to play a character that's younger that I've been playing younger to play older. So I was like, wow, this is really tough. You know, and I only had two scenes to do it. You know, I didn't have like this whole drawn out show that I could, you know, demonstrate a lot of different facets of this, of this little, uh, diamond, as you might say, of, of not being a captain. I had two scenes. So to, to demonstrate being a captain or a commander within two scenes to me was very scary and difficult. And I at first thought that they were going to use somebody else to play the part, you know, someone older. And I was afraid that they might not bring the qualities that I had put to Nog into it, that they might change it. And I was worried about that. And I told the director, well, if you do that, just make sure he sticks true to the character. And then they, I found out that they were going to use him. I'm like, all right. And I'm like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. I got I to gotta play him older. And, and I talked to the director, and we, we, which is David Livingston, and we decided on, as commander, to use my own voice and as captain to make it deeper. I didn't make it deep enough. I think they changed it a little bit in audio because it felt really uncomfortable to all of a sudden talk real deep, you know, I was like, I just felt really uncomfortable when you're so used to playing a character one way. The feedback has been that everybody believed me as captain or as commander. And I saw it too. And I thought, Hey, I I did okay. And it was awkward because I looked really ugly. I thought I was all crinkly and old and, and I, and the the way I played it was I played it more myself being older because I make Nog a lot more energetic and talking a little faster and a lot of fun. Yeah, Jake, you know, and he goes like this. And then I played me a little bit slowed down and not so animated. And that's how I made him older, just to be more calm. And that seemed to work. There were a couple of things I liked about it. First, Tony Todd in the episode. and He was great, yeah. He, he tried so hard. He really worked hard at getting a lot of the, the nuances of Ciroc. And he's all, how does he sit usually? Kind of, you know, sits like this. How did he walk? You know, and we talked a couple of times. I gave him ideas of what we did and, and our thoughts. And he goes, okay. And he really worked hard. And I think that was really good. That was really great. Another thing, too, was that it's nice to see that Nog and Jake are look like they would be lifelong friends, yeah. too. Oh, definitely. Of course. Which is, I think that's something they established in the beginning of the show. You know, we're friends. And, and, and that was a friendship that was rooted pretty deep, especially with the arguments with his father and, and the little date thing. And then coming back, and we'll, we'll always be friends. And I think that's... That's really important. Who knows where when Jake gets older, Ciroc, you know, n- new shows or movies. It's it's really exciting because it, it opens many doors if they continue to open them. You, who knows what they're going to do? They may never do a movie of DS9 or they may not, you know, but if they do or if they go to another sh- episode show or there's just a lot of open doors for them. And, and it's exciting for me because it keeps me working if they use me, which I would be more than happy to do. Another thing um, is uh, I think what is a fantastic opportunity is what they really kind of miss this with Wesley. And they can do it through Nog now is they can really show what it's like for a cadet in Starfleet. And yeah. uh, and I heard that when uh, there was a, an incident supposedly where Rick Berman called you into his office and said, yeah, you're going to Starfleet, but don't worry, uh, we're going to use you. Did that actually happen? Or yeah, you where'd, t- you hear, where'd you hear that from? I just threw the grapevine. Uh, I just threw the grapevine. Yeah. Yes, that is true. I was when I did Heart of Stone. Actually, I was a little concerned, like, oh, I wonder if they're writing me out because I had really enjoyed this 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 
character. It's so much fun. And the job, you know, it was recurring. I was working a lot, and I was just really enjoying it. And Rick Berman said, Eric, come here. I want to talk to you for a second. I'm all like, so I, I, I want you to know we have no intention of writing you out of the script, out of this show. We, we love your character. We love your work. And if anything, it'll bring you more work. And those are pretty much, I think, his exact words, if I remember correctly. And in other words, it made me feel like, oh, good. They, you know, they're not planning on doing that. Even when I did, um, when I left for Little Green Men, I left for Starfleet, I'm not as worried as everybody seems to be calling it this, my swan song episode. I'm like, no, you know, because I feel comfortable. I mean, why would they build it up that much and then just say, well, that's all we're going to do? I mean, why would they go to that trouble? So I, I hope that they have plans. I mean, they could not write me ever again. And if they did, say la vie. You know, I've had a great time. And yeah, I'll be bummed and I'll be depressed and because it's a, it's, it's a great show, great crew. And, and I think they're writing really good stuff. People are liking it more now this season. And people, I haven't heard one negative comment about me going to Starfleet. Mm-hmm. Everyone likes that idea. I think people are excited about it, like you said. They, can, they equate me with the Wesley Crusher, which is great because I'm friends with Will. I haven't talked to him in a while. I talked to him at the last convention. And I think they like my character going there more than they like Wesley. I think. I don't know. Only because I feel I hear more negative things about how people feel about Wesley Crusher, which I don't know. if I, I didn't watch Star Trek, so I can't really say how I agree. I know Will is a great guy. And um, he's a very fine actor. He's, he's excellent. And um, and I, I think he got a lot of blame for that, which was not his fault at all. And so maybe they're doing a second chance. You know, let's let's work on Nog then and make him go to Starfleet. And, and it's also great because then you see how someone who's from a different race, so to speak, deals with, you know, the being in a place that people might make it hard for him. Talk about some of the episodes, um, in particular Little Green Men. What was what was your reaction when you got the script to that? Oh, well, what, what, what was your reaction to seeing the show? I mean, oh. you love, right, same thing. It was just, I mean, we are the Roswell incident. It's just the funniest idea, you know. Everyone's trying to explain UFOs and all this, and then what do you do? You have actually Ferengis, you know, from Star Trek explaining UFO phenomenon, and it's just really funny, you know. You can't, it was, it was pure comedy in its essence, not necessarily what we did with it, but just that we were the Roswell incident. Was, and then, you know, what we're trying to do is, is you think your, your typical idea of, of UFO, oh, wow, it's, they're evil or they're bad or, or they, they're just viewing us. When we're like, we're trying to make a profit. You know, Arm is trying to make a profit. One of us is scared to death. And one of them is, being, is manipulating them to believe what they really want to believe. Because, you know, we have no intentions. You know, we live with humans. And, and that, you never think of aliens as already living with humans. So there's little thoughts like that that I thought were just really great. It, it was a rare opportunity to see the three of you all together. Yeah. And that was kind of neat. The chemistry was there, too, for all the different Ferengi. On. You don't usually get to see that on Deep Space Nine. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you kept seeing it, it would become a Ferengi show. Yeah. And I know in the first season they did a lot with Quark and the Ferengi and so forth. And and there's there's how many people on the show now? And you can't center a show. And there's like well, how many episodes they do per season. You know, and they got to develop everybody. They got to, you know, then there's going to be a lot of the people that love Nana Visitor's character who hate Ferengis are like, God, why do they keep writing Ferengis in? You know, so there's some people who are going to love it and people are not. You can't please everybody. You guys got to do a little bit and just keep going. But it was nice to work with all three. We've had little scenes, but not a whole episode. And I think the chemistry works because all three of our characters are written so differently, which, which was makes the Ferengis great because you, you view another race as all the same, which is kind of prejudicial. You know, you don't view humans as all the same. You got the bad ones, you got the good ones, you got the in between. Well, it's the same with Ferengis. Not all of them are going to be evil. Not all of them are going to be as greedy as as Armin, even though that's the basic trait of a Ferengi. They're going to be like a little self confident, um, a little insecure like Rom, a little a little uh, assertive like Nog, and a little devious like Armin. And then we're going to be devious too, where we're like selling Armin. No, we know you did that, and you know I'm not in Starfleet yet, but I'll take ten percent. I mean, so we're still a Ferengi, but we still all have our own qualities, and I think that's really, really good because it, it, it broadens your horizons on the Ferengi. Yeah, I think this was a home run as far as the Ferengi episodes. I thought out of all the ones I've seen, this is my favorite by far, and they were in your ultra. It was a blast. And the, and the supporting cast, the, the other people that played, you know, um, uh, played all the other characters were great, too. You know, they were really good, and, and everybody just had fun, and, and they were really nice people, and... It's just a, such a fun show to work on. I really enjoy working. The crew is always great. I never, I never have anything bad to say. I really like, I really love working on the show. I'm very fortunate. So, what about the other Ferengi on the show as people, like uh, Max and 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 Armin? What are they? How you guys like uh, see each other? Like yeah. off the set once in a while? Well, their egos are really big, you know. And <laughs> so no, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Don't make sure that better not stop there. They're great. I mean, we work on the scripts. Usually, when we're working together, we get together and work on the scripts. 
I see Max sometimes outside more than I would see Armin. Armin's a lot busier, and, and I'm closer to Max only because I work with him more than I do with Armin. Armin, <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and then Sneak is a really great guy. Armin has, they're, and you know what's awesome about them is they're so talented, both of them. They're such talented actors. And, and, and listening to them and watching them and hearing them work, you know, giving them their advice is, is so great. And they work slightly different. And, and we all three work differently a little bit. But it's, it's great working with them because we work together. And <laughs> Max and I are more insecure than Armin. Armin's kind of like the ringer, you guys, it's fine, you're doing great. And I think it's harder for Max and I because we work less than Armin. So we don't get to keep fine tuning our character. We always have to jump like a month later or two to get back into it. Oh, well, how was it, you know? So it's more difficult in that aspect. I really enjoy also working with Avery. Um, the scenes that I've done, I, I just, he locks in on you when you do a scene with him. He looks right in your eyes and he, and he, he just gives you, as an actor, you know, you give the ball and you take it back and it's like a, a two way street here, you know, and you, and you give and take. And some actors don't do that. None, actually, I've, I've never experienced that on DS9. I've never actually experienced that. You know, I've never experienced a bad thing in, in acting, but I know that there are some actors that get real selfish, you know, I've heard. I've never experienced that. And, and, and working with Avery, he's just, I love, like when I did Heart of Stone, it's like one of the favorite scenes of my life. Because I got a lot to do inside, and, and Avery was just right there with me, you know. And I always just love working with him. He's got such an aura about him. I just I really enjoy working with him as much as, you know, as much as with Armin and, and, and Max also. But it's different. It's a different vibe working with both of them because the character relationship is different. The relationship with, with, with Avery is more like my um, role model. I look up to him, you know, like, oh, that's who I want to be, so to speak. Armin and Max, they're family, you know, ah, family, ah, hucha, hucha, head to hoo, you know, <laughs> love you, you know, it's that kind of a thing. So there's a different vibe, but with Avery, it's like, he's my mentor, you know, and I look up to him, and when I'm in there with the scene, I get that, I try and get that same feeling, and that's why I think I enjoy working with him so much. And he's such a fine actor, and I think he's, I think he's taken a lot of harsh credit from the fans because of the way his character's been written instead of his talent. Well, this year I think he's right on. I think they have found Cisco this year. Yeah. I think they have gotten perfect. It takes perfect. time. I mean, it's ta- it takes time, especially when your show's built around the characters. The actors work within the characters, see what their their vibe is, see what their nuances are, and write those and write it for them. So the audience, and then that's how it builds up to the point where it's getting at now. You know, where people, are, God, the show's great now. People are really turning around now it's that they really right. They're really loving the show, and I think it's taken three longer because. It's built only around the characters, you know? It's not built around the action, so to speak. So it took a while to build up the character to get a following, and, and I think it's turning around now, which I'm excited about, because I think it was a great show from the beginning. I really liked it. I thought the idea, it was good that they did something different, that they didn't have it trekking somewhere, that it was another window to this vast universe, you know? I, I thought that was so important. I thought it had been boring if that, well, another shuttle show. Yeah. Same thing. See this again. Be the same story, just different circumstances. And it's nice to see a different show with different circumstances and, and it's centered around the characters. And it's good that I'm glad that, that people are liking it more. Would you said Heart of Stone is, would you say that's your favorite episode? Well, I, I mean, Visitor actually, not for myself. I really, I really, I mean, I even knew what was going to happen and I started to get teary eyed. And I'm not like exaggerating. I just, I thought Avery just did an awesome job and Tony Todd. I mean, even when those two were together, they, that's how Avery is. He just locks into whoever's working with. So I love, I, he's just right there. I mean, his character's that way, written that way. You know, you got other characters that are, ah, blah, 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 blah. You know, who, you don't, you don't get that. But, um, and, and Ciroc did such a fine job. They all did. And it was just very heartwarming. I liked Heart of Stone for myself. I just thought that was my favorite episode as Nog, um, just because I got to do so much. And it was me, you know, as Nog pushing and, you know, and going for something, which just relates so much to my own life. And I, and I, and I thought that was one of, you know, be, I don't mean to be arrogant. I'd rather be modest, but I was, thought that was one of my finest performances for myself that I really like to watch. And I'm very hard on myself going, oh, God, you know. That's an interesting thing. I mean, how much do you watch yourself? Or do you try to avoid it? or? Oh, no, I don't avoid it at all. I love to watch Nog and see how it's doing, just to make sure that what I aim for is coming across. I always like to check up on myself or, or go, oh, that wasn't working, and, and that was fun, or to laugh. Like when I watched um, Little Green Man, I, 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 I had this one look. Oh, yeah, the funniest thing I thought I did was, and I didn't know I did it, is when Rom is rambling off about the the stuff, and I'm all, I'm looking at Armin going, what is he talking about? And Armin goes, I don't know. And it was just, it was like shtick, but it was so funny. Because I had this look like, huh, yeah, sure, Dad, good job. It was, 
And Jessica, actually, my fiance, pointed it out, and I'm like, oh, my God, that was really funny. I like the uh, the earlobe scene. That was oh, a, one yeah. of my favorites, too, with the uh, nurse. I thought that was great. Yeah, that was uh, it was a fun episode. It was a lot of fun. I think Armin had the best lines. I was more the even Steven kind of a character. I got to do the, all right, I'll tell you what you want to know kind of thing. But other than that, I was more like the the info. Well, that's cigarettes, and it was really bad. And that's the atomic bomb. I was the info guy. Yeah, that's right. So I kind of was the straight man, and uh, and Armin got to play the the manipulator and, and Rom got to play man Max got to play the uh the whiner. So I, I was kind of like, ah, okay, it's fun. But I didn't get to have the fun. Like Armin got to go, you know, hit his head and go, They're so stupid or they don't understand and and I got to go, That's because of this. That's because of that. Uh when you're not uh working, you know, as an actor, what do you what do you like to do in your spare time? Bowl. No, I I'm not a big bowler. Um actually I, I teach martial arts. Yeah. Um, yeah, Chinese Kempo. I enjoy that a, a lot. I'm going to school, taking like directing classes and production classes, getting into that photography, and, and I, I really want to move into that area. Mm-hmm. Spend a lot of time with my fiance. Just moved in, yeah. getting married in a year. Go to movies and stuff. You know, just I, I'm really busy. You know, taking a couple classes at Moore Park because my little hobbies of, of uh, in that and martial arts takes up a lot of my time. I teach and I do it myself. I'm still learning. Yeah, and direct just directed my little short student film and stuff. And, Hey, thank you for listening to Sci-Fi Talk, but stick around. I have more. Let's get back to Sci-Fi Talk. I'm Tony Tolado. Thinking about going behind the camera on Deep oh, Space? Oh, oh, well, I don't know if I'll be ready while Deep Space Nine is still going. Uh, maybe. I'd like to They have like a little directing. Whenever they have a director, they, they shadow the other directors to get gist of the show. I'd like to do that just to learn um, if they'll let me. Because I really, I really want to move into that area. I'm really getting a, a longing to do that. I really enjoy it a lot. It's a lot of work, but I enjoy the work that it entails. You mentioned the physical training when you were on Voyager. You played a young Kazon warrior. I noticed that your arms were pretty built up. That wasn't makeup. That was you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I work out too, and actually, Jess and I work out together. And um, yeah, that you know that was really interesting. That worked as the first time as a kid. That worked because the kid was a warrior. And he's not a human, so you can believe if you suspend your your imagination or not suspend your reality for a minute to say, you know, it's a, it's not a human race, so why can't another race's kids be muscular? I mean, that was, you know, when I saw that, I go, oh, my God, how can I play a kid? I, you know, I'm fairly muscular. But then I'm thinking, no, that's perfect because he's a warrior kid. He's supposed to be. Why not? You know, they're a different race. They're not human. We, we're, i got to get out of the mentality that all races are the same, that their kids have to be, you know, less muscular. But that's not true, so... And I actually had to audition for that. I heard, you know, people commenting, oh, why did they use another Star Trek character? Why can't they just get a new one and somebody else? And I'm like, well, let me tell you something. I had to audition for it, for one thing. They didn't just give it to me. They did try and cast it. They didn't go to me first. They tried to cast it. They couldn't find a kid that could that could take that material and deliver it the way it needed to be delivered. And they couldn't find an adult that could deliver it. Well, they found an adult that could deliver it, but didn't look young enough. And so then they auditioned me, and I was just right there in that middle, you know. I, I could come up to the point of delivery that needed for that character, that harshness, you know, and right, right in Robert Beltran's face and then be a kid at the same time. I mean, I hate to, I mean, now I'm being arrogant again, but I, I think I was perfectly cast for that. It's hard to find, you know, a kid that's muscular and then can, you know. Well, there's another thing, too, is that you actually had, going back to that, that, that magical word of chemistry, but you, the scenes you had of Robert Beltran, uh, there was a lot of good chemistry between the two of you, almost uh-huh. like a, you know, because of his beliefs as, you know, as, as a Native American on the show, uh, there was a lot of, uh, you know, similarities, and he was, he sort of had a kinship with you, and plus the fact that, I don't know if Chakotay has a family, but he's, you know, far away from Earth and all, and his family, but there was like a bonding between the two of you in that episode. Yeah, it was, I, we, I had a lot of fun with Robert. We were joking around through the whole show. We just had, we had a blast. I think, you know, we keep talking about chemistry, and I think, and I know why, I think I know how chemistry works, and I think anybody can have it, but it's it's giving what you need to give to the other actor and then having him give it back. If one person doesn't give, then that's where the chemistry falls flat. You have to actually give whatever you're giving to the other character and then wait for him to give what he's giving to you and take it. I think that's, that's what it sounds like because that's what I seem to be doing with all the people that you say I have chemistry with. Because I, and, I, and they do the same, and I think that's where the chemistry lies, is in that. When you see actors that don't have chemistry, there must there's something... There's something holding that. They're not giving of themselves. They're not opening up enough, I think. So the director could only help so far. Oh, yeah. Nobody can. You can't say you guys need chemistry and get it out. 
you either have it or you don't. It, it's it's but it's a giving of yourself in the scene. In other words, if I'm a Robert, I'm I'm just right at him and I'm I'm looking at him. I'm giving to him what I need to give him, and I'm waiting for his response. And bam, he gives it back, and then I go right back at him. That's how because you're locking in on what you need to talk about. I think maybe not, maybe so. Timing or, or like in music or something, there's like a yeah. rhythm to it. Yeah, yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. I heard mixed views about my um my performance on um. On Voyager, really? I well, most of the time it's been good, but I mean, like on the internet, I mean, not everything's going to be 100 percent good. So some people would comment the fact that, you know, I heard one guy said, you know, I don't know why everyone's whining about Aaron Eisberg's performance on that show. Obviously, you thought he was a kid, and he's not. So obviously, he did something right. And I thought that was, hey, all right, one from my corner. Hey. And most of the time, people and I'm all, oh, I like to hear all those people what they're whining about. And mostly, what they whined about was, was that I was nog. Like, oh, I could hear nog in that. Personally, I watched and I think. I don't see Nog. No, yeah, no, you no. might hear the voice, but for God's sakes, I'm the same person. You're going to yeah, hear sure. the tone is going to be the same. But there were no nuances that were the same. I didn't walk the same. I didn't talk the same. The rhythm of the words weren't the same. And I feel really good about what I did, and I really worked hard on that. And actually, Max helped me a lot. We, he was kind of my coach on that. And I really I really gave him my all, and I was really proud. I thought maybe I overacted a few times, but other than that, I felt really good about my performance. It was something I was really proud of. And I think people are getting too nitpicky. Why are they having Nog play this character? I knew it was Nog. No, you didn't. You knew it because of my name. I mean, come on. You know, you're, if you don't watch the show religiously, you're not going to go, oh. You might go, wait a second. You know, you might think, but you have to know. You know, I mean, I I, I was really, it wasn't hard for me because both of those characters are at different ends of the spectrum. Right. They're not like right next to each other. One's really tough. One's really, there were, there's so many different nuances between the two characters. Well, the way I saw it was, it was the first time somebody opened the door and let us see what the Kazons were about. Oh, right. Yeah. So it was like, oh, this is what they're like, and this is how they, you know, how their relationship with their children, how they yeah. train them, and all that. For the first time, you saw them like the Klingons with a bad hair day, <laughs> yeah. and and now it's like, oh, they're a little different. They have their own nuances. So for me, it was like, oh, they, you know, the door's been open now, and now we see a different side of it. With this character, you know, we could be led in a direction we probably couldn't be led before. So that's why I'd like to see him come back. Well, yeah, it's hard. It's hard, I think, to bring him back because Voyager goes in one direction. They're trying to get back home. And I'm, and they already passed the point where I was at. I mean, how would I get to another point unless somehow they fell into a hole, came back, and recircled again? I, I had hoped they kept me on the ship, on the ship, on the spaceship, so I got to get a regular part. But you know, oh, the kiss, the kiss I thought was really an important part because um, that showed, like you said, another factor of this of this religion of this group of people. And I was disappointed how the actual kiss ended up on the screen because I had to loop the cry differently than how I did it in in the original take, and I. And I understood why I looped it. It made sense. Okay, yeah, let's bring it down. I brought the cry down. But then when I actually saw the finished product, I didn't think it worked, that I thought my original instinct before was correct. I had this big, long, ah, you know, cry, you know, because just like letting everything out, you know, and then fell into his arms as he caught me. And it was really, to me, more dramatic, and I thought it was better. But when I went in looping and they had, we got to tone that down, we want a little cry, I thought, oh, okay, I see. It looks like a little overacting. It looks a little big. But then when I saw it again, I'm all, no, it wasn't enough. I needed to just keep it where it was at because it was more, that, that point to me was like the, the climax. That's where it needed to, to hit home. You know, where you come up and then we're going to go back down because we're going to escape. Right. But it, it, I didn't get, I didn't feel that when I saw it. That bothered me. I was like, oh, because that was, that was a hard scene to do, you know, to cry. And, you know, and just, and I, and I, he couldn't cry like, oh God, they're going to kill me. You know, <laughs> he had to be like a, ah, you know, like a, a, a warrior cry. It's something that you have to do in Star Trek, uh, you know. I guess that's why they call it acting. But you're sitting in, you're sitting at a control panel, looking at absolutely nothing, and yeah. pretending that something is there. Is that easy, hard for you, or how do um, you find? One, do you have any? Do you remember any ones in particular? Because ones were yeah. sometimes are easier, sometimes are hard. Like when I was in the, when I was do, the hardest one, was when I was um, testing for my Starfleet thing, mm. and I was in the shuttle. That was the hardest. Okay. I really. Well, that's when he came knocking on the door. Yes, exactly. That was the hardest one. I the director wanted me to have this double take, and I really had a hard time doing it for some reason. I don't. I mean, Jake came up. Mm-hmm. I just had a really hard time doing it. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not perfect. Yeah. But the time when Jake and I were in there and we were, you know, the Jemadar episode where we were flying in. Oh my God, we're screaming! Ah, that was really easy. So sometimes it's really easy. Sometimes it's really difficult. I like the uh, the what I call the camping trip episode. Yeah, that was the gem- that, was, that, that was the Gemindar. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. That was funny. That was hysterical. But yeah, the, the shuttle thing when I was doing the because we you know sometimes you you have the special effects guy standing over there. He's going okay, follow my hand, and we're going ah, ah we're following the hand, 
But then, you know, when we have to react to the ship going, you know, you're kind of doing this, but it's, <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's, it's awkward. And yeah. then I have to do this double take, and, and it felt like really stupid, but I should have done it bigger. Have you seen any other movies or any of the other series at all? Oh, yeah, I love to go to see the movies just because I love movies. I don't watch the other series that often because I'm not home. Otherwise, I would because I, I mean, I, I like to watch because I, I like some of the other actors. I met all the other actors on Voyager who I might say are just a fine cast. They are so nice. Jennifer, um, the place, I never, I, yes. Kess, I knew, I didn't know if I was going to say Keys or Kess, so I want to make sure I said it correctly, was just such a, she's like a wonderful host, so, do you know this person, did you, did you meet this guy, and she's just so soft, her personality is so down to earth, it was like, she's like below the soil, she's so down to earth, um, she was so nice, and I just had a blast with Robert Beltran, and, and, uh, and Kate was very nice, how's everything going when they came by, and, and, and Tim Russ was was very very cool, and Ethan Phillips was very was a lot of fun. Came on the other set and actually gave me a compliment on my on my work, which was very nice. And actually, oh, you know what happened? This is a great story. I went into Loop, I think, for Voyager, and I walked in, and uh, Patrick Stewart was there, and I was wanted to meet him. I never got to meet the other cast, you know, after starting. And I was kind of walking in. I'm like, oh, all right, yeah, let's do this thing. I'm like, Whoa, hey, what's going on? <laughs> oh, Patrick, yeah, nice to meet you. And he's all, oh, he's all, and he was actually talking to me about things. He's all, you know, I, I think you do wonderful work. I'm like, hey, thanks. I was like, that was such a nice compliment. I mean, coming from him, the big guy, you know, and, and it was neat that he saw my work. And I was like, I was really, it really made my day when I met him. He really, when another actor, especially like on the show, compliments your work, it means a lot because it's, it's like your peers. Just as much as it means a lot when a fan says that, when you have fans, because they keep you going. They keep you on the show. But it's a different energy. It's like, you know, it's your peers saying, hey, you're doing good, rather than, he's not that good. I don't know why everybody likes him. You're like, jeez, that sucks. But they don't know what they're seeing then, you know, or they're just jealous. But when they say that, you know, and it's just really nice, especially, you know, ones that are very respected. And I think Ethan Phillips is a fine actor. I mean, not just on Star Trek, but the other work he's done. It's part of the Benson connection, you know. Yeah, right. <laughs> Him and right. Renee came yeah, from Benson. That's right. That's right. <laughs> it was really nice. He, I, I'm, he gave me a compliment. It was really, made me feel really good. What's it like to be, to sort of be in this world of Star Trek, especially when, maybe not so much when you're in it and working, but when you go out and everybody like, you know, the, the, the fan adulation and all that. How do you, how do you deal with that? First of all, I'm very fortunate. I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not going to be one to complain about it at all because I, I chose it. I chose this field. I'm, this is what I want. I want to work. I want to work more. And, and it's an extra perk, actually, the conventions and stuff because, um, you go to them. It, it's like, it's a bonus to the show. I mean, how often is the shows, you know, you don't see friends going off on, you know, and, and doing conventions. I mean, I mean, I'm just saying they're very fortunate also. They have a show, a hit show that's smoking, you know, so, you know, they're making lots of money. They're enjoying what they're doing. I mean, that's, that's the best. That's the most important thing is doing what you enjoy doing. Whatever it is in your life, just make sure you enjoy what it is. If you don't, then why the hell are you doing it? You know, why are you living for retirement when you may not even make it to your retirement? It doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, people have different views about your, your job, so to speak. Um, in regards to the fandom, you know, fans and, and agita adulation, I'm very lucky that I'm in makeup because I don't, I don't, I can go places, you know, and, and be rather anonymous. When they do know who I am, I love it when people come up and say, hey, I like your work. You do a great job. It was nice meeting you. Yeah, hey, that was cool. And they talk to me like they'll talk to anybody. But I do get uncomfortable when they come and they, and they kind of like, oh, hi. Oh, and they put me on this pedestal. I'm like, you don't need to do that. I, I'm just an actor. I play a part in a show. You know, you don't, I'm not, you know, why should you, that's, a, that's, I have such an interesting idea about fam, fame. It's so weird to me. Why do we consider fame such a, a wonderful thing, a great thing? Wow, he's on TV. He must be somebody really good. He must be a great person. If he endorses this product, it must be good. Why? I mean, even myself, I'm not saying I don't do that. Robert De Niro, oh my God, there's Robert De Niro, there's Al Pacino. You know, I'd be like, oh man, Al, how's it going? You know, I'm not saying I don't do it either, but it's weird that that affects us this way. And I always find it so fascinating that that fame affects people, that they go and they go, oh my God, look, that's, that's not. Yeah, I'm just Aaron, how you doing? Relax, just have a cup of coffee. Sit down, talk to me. You know, don't be so, there's no need to. Sure, sign an autograph, I don't mind. But treat me like a treat, you know, just be normal. Just be, uh, you know, I really don't like being put up on a pestle. It's uncomfortable because I don't feel like I deserve it. I didn't do anything for it. Put Nelson Mandela, you know, put somebody that's done something that, that's really made a, a mark that, that's a great human being that, you know, put people that are good people, you know, go up to someone that you like, you know, a really good person, go, you know, you're awesome. 
you are you are awesome. Why? Because I'm on TV. Are you telling me that I'm awesome when when I could be a complete jerk? I mean, I'm not, but I'm <laughs> well, let, let me let me throw something at you. Maybe in a way you are doing your own little piece of things because you look at Jake and you look at Nog, two different cultures, two different planets getting along, right. and and a young impressionable kid who's watching Deep Space Nine saying, "Hey, if they can do that." Maybe something sticks in their mind. So you never know. Right. That's true. In that instance, yes. But I'm not going to walk around going, hey, you know, I'm a, I'm, you should be putting me up here because I do good stuff. Yeah. But I don't think that's what people are coming up for. But you, but you got a point. But, you know, and if, and if some kid sees that and it makes a difference in his life, hey, that's, that's awesome. You know, you can't ask for more. Talk about Michael Westmore and his work, the makeup that you wear. Uh, what's the process like for you? You know, you usually have to get up at four o'clock in the morning. Actually, does my makeup is Camille. Calve, wonderful, wonderful lady. Um, Michael Key used to do it before when he was on the show. He was a great guy. And they put my makeup on. What is, you come in like, you should have to be there at 4 o'clock in the morning, so it's cold. They put the glue on your face, which is cold. Then they put the headpiece on. And then once it's going, it's okay. And once it's on, it's better. And then when it comes off, it's even better because it feels really good when the head comes off. It's like, oh, I can breathe, so to speak. But um, that's pretty much the basis of it. It's just kind of cold. And think about, you know, like, putting some gel kind of stuff on your face right when you wake up in the morning and you're nice and cold. It's just kind of like... <sighs> what do you do to kill time when you're being made up? Oh, I just sit there. It's only an hour and a half. I just kind of sit and watch and talk or listen to music, listen to music. Usually we talk or sometimes I go over the script usually. Mm -hmm. But it's hard because if you're putting the makeup on, it's hard to kind of read. <laughs> Besides uh, your own characters, anybody you have a, a real favorite on uh, on any of the Star Trek, in particular Deep Space Nine since that's where you work? I like, I like Avery's character. Just because he's the top dog, so to speak. He's, I like the way he, I like, because his, his, um, presence is different than all the other. You know, he's not the same. And, um, and he's got this, I like, I like his nuances, the way he does his character and his, his power. Not his power over people, but his, his, his intensity. I think that's what I enjoy the most. I like watching him. And I love watching Max and, and Armin when they, when they're in their realm. They're a lot of fun to watch. I mean, I like everybody for their, it's so diplomatic. I like everybody for their all all their little things that they put into the characters and that they do. I, I think I like watching Avery a lot. Let's let's look down the road. Is there is there a sort of life after Star Trek? Is there any? Do you have anything you'd want to do after Star Trek? Well, I like to. I really like to direct. Um, I'm, I know there's books that I want to make into movies. I've got, so I got to learn how to direct. I have a lot inside my head, but I just don't know how to get it out. Um, not in the way of stories. I'm not a very good. I mean, I can write, but I'm not. I don't have these big ideas for these blockbuster movies. I just have little films i like to just make movies though i like to continue acting i just like to just continue to be happy i'm so happy where i'm at in my life i have a wonderful fiance i have a, a wonderful home i have i'm, I'm healthy i'm um, happy i'm working I'm, I'm, I'm making enough money to enjoy life i'm you know really can't ask for much more except for some girl scout cookies <laughs> i got the thin mints going already <laughs> But, you know, it's funny, but it's never the way, it, like when you're probably a kid dreaming about how things were, it's probably never the way it is. It's sometimes like a pleasant surprise, isn't it? Yeah, I went for this. Mm -hmm. This is what I wanted. I was going for it. I didn't know how it was going to be, but when I was a kid, I didn't want to be an actor, actually, at all, because I thought I couldn't be a parent if I was an actor. I'm, oh, I'll never be able to be a, be a good father. I never told you that. But when I was a kid, I never thought, oh, I'll never be an actor, because, which is so weird, because I was really adamant, oh, actors, they never can be good parents. They're always busy. I'll never be an actor. I'll never be an actor. I want to be a doctor or psychologist or psychiatrist or pediatrician. I want to be some kind of this or that. And then I fell in love with it. And I go, I want to be an actor. And I went for it. And I've just been going for it. And since I've been going for it, those have been the happiest years of my life other than before I was sick. One last thing I want to ask you about. Is there, uh, I heard that something, there's something coming up down the pike for Nog. Is that true? Or well, I'm, uh, yeah, there's a two-parter coming up that I'm in, oh, but that was that was it. I'm not, it's not about me, more or less than. Well, I mean, little things. I want to join Red Squad, which is an elite group at Starfleet Academy. Mm -hmm, but cool. yeah, but it's not. But that's more or less to tell the story. It has nothing. I don't think they're doing it. They used me for it, but um, there, there's a changeling on Earth, and they want to. Um, Cisco has to go back to Starfleet Academy, does security for them to find this changeling because Odo comes with them because. You know, they have, that, Odo's kind of their ace in the pocket to find the changeling. And they find out there's a conspiracy and it has to do with Red Squad. And it's not part of Red Squad. They're like, Nog, we need to talk about Red Squad. And I'm like, did you get me in? And he's all, no, Nog, you need to tell me the names. I'm all, I'm sorry, Captain, I can't do that. And he's all, I don't think, son, I'm asking you to tell me. I think you're supposed, uh, yes, sir. So it was kind of a cool little scene between me and Avery. And, um, so that's kind of the storyline on that for me. So it's not a big storyline for me other than I'm glad I'm in it. They put me in it. I'm waiting to see what they do next with me, though, if they do, you know. 
you get to see you in Starfleet at the Academy yeah. in, interacting with other cadets, too? No, that's the only problem you don't. Yeah, so I hope they come back and do that. They didn't do that. I know people want that because I want to do that, you know. I mention it. I say I'm having trouble, you know. I'm no one's, you know, I'm not getting along. I'm all, and that's what I like about Nog. He's all, no, I got to be the best. I got to join this elite squad. How do I do that? You know, he doesn't settle for less. That's what I love about my character, is he really goes for what he wants. He's like, I don't want this. I want that. And how do I get there? You need to help me. Get, get me over there. He says to Avery, I need your signature. Come on, please. I need this opportunity. He's like so desperate to 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 make something of himself. That's why I, I love when they write me because they keep. And I can love to correlate because that's part of my own life. I'm so desperate to do what I want. You know, I want to direct. I've got to learn how to do this. I think the door has been open for more Starfleet nod stories. Yeah, definitely. Where they go, who knows? That that's, that's only remains to be seen. It's like a book that hasn't, the uh, rest of the pages haven't been written yet. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's how I keep playing it every time I, I do a show. Okay, what, are they, what am I going to do now? And I'm all, all right. Keep tuning in for more of my Trek Tuesday podcast. This is Tony Tolado.